Um, uh, so where were we <laughs> when we last well, talked? In we did the last chapter, which yeah. was oh, that's uh, right, we finished eleven. I recall, yeah, which was basically talking about um, different forms of validation, cross validation, and how you go mm-hmm. about doing those. And basically, we're saying that you need to make sure that you re that when you are doing cross validation or anything else you need to make sure that the uncertainty that you create in the model build is pushed into your predictions uh when you do validation as well otherwise you end up with models that don't have uncertainty in them right um, might be useful in certain cases for sure yeah and then it was also suggesting leave one out with being one of the one of the better methods to use um Although, as we know from work, is computationally it's quite expensive to leave one out, and it's not necessarily always best than just doing a tenfold cross validation. Um, but um, this isn't necessarily the Bayesian approach. Isn't always necessary for that, is it? Um, no. uh, in general, we use it so that we can say when we found when we've got a finding or when we've got a prediction that there is uncertainty in that and we can use that to say we believe that this result falls within expected parameters or alternatively that the, a difference between two things is more or less substantial within the within the parameter of error uh, based on probability so there is a probability that uh, the, the effect we've seen is decent and we can reinforce that by using different methods of resampling from the probability distributions. And that's how we prove strengthen it. And that was basically, as far as I understood it, what the whole of the last chapter was about. Um, so this section here is about transformations. Um, so I don't expect it to be particularly complex. I have read, um, I have read m- this chapter, however, <laughs> It was about two weeks ago, so a little while ago that I read it also, but I, I feel like I remember uh, most of it, and I made little notes in the book so we, I can look and see. Mm. I can't, I don't actually have my book up here, so um, because oh. I'm in the attic of my house, Mm-mm. um, so um, feel free to uh, to jump in anywhere because it's, it's always yeah. good to have a handy text. So the first part it starts off with is, is linear transformations. Um, so what are we doing with a linear transformation in this particular case? Um, so we'll just work through the examples as usual. So they're using the earnings data set, which is the one where they talk about the height and the, how that relates to earnings, but actually it's just to do with the fact that, in my opinion, that when they were collecting the data back in the day, it was mostly men in the workplace, um, you know, world moved on. Um, anyhow, uh, so what they've got here is height, plus error, the default priors. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to predict earnings with uh, height centered at one. One plus height. One plus height. Oh. Anyway, never mind. Don't know why there's that. Um, because you'd have thought that they move it across the middle of the average height, wouldn't you? Yeah, Wait, yeah. Is that what they've done here? Because here, right, if we're saying it's it's b not plus or b beta not plus beta mm-hmm. one height plus a. Yeah. But what That's what this function high. does? What this uh, BM, brm function does? What what this package is? Uh, sorry about. Oh, so um, BRM is basically a, um, it's a method of implementing STAN. So STAN is, prob- is um, kind of like probability algebra. And it's, it comes as part of R and it's in the background. But when yeah. we do normal calculations, we use um, just the normal like uh, stats packages and the math packages. But with BRM is designed to specifically work with Bayesian probability and so that um so um so it has to use stan in the background 
And so what it's doing here is it's just creating a linear model. So if you ignore everything else here and just look at this bit here, normally if you just that's just the structure of a normal linear model. Um, let me show you um, quickly. So if I um, I'll just I'll change the screen, change what I'm sharing. Uh, where are we? Yeah, there we are. It's okay. Uh, right. So you can see my screen now. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, so I, ca I can't. I don't actually have the data here uh, mm. or access to the data. But what I can do is I can just show you. What, so um, if we do a model with BRM. Where are we? There we are. So if we get that, right, so the BRM for BRM model is like this. Actually, maybe I can do it. Uh, no, it, no, I need to find the whole uh, route for the package, don't I? Yeah, I think it, it is be in there, but yeah, then you have to find the, the package. The way to capture that. Um, real quick on my end here. In Visual Studio, you tend to be, you can like just click on something, you can get the uh, relative path. Yeah. I usually do goofy uh, Linux commands, and then I figured it. Um, let's see where. Uh, oh wait, yeah. Let me look at the. This is chapter 11. Actually, what? Let's do this. Go to the GitHub and then I go straight to regressions. Oh, stories. also good. No, that wrong way around. Uh, and then where is it? Bits. There we go. And we'll just capture that. Oh, and that's the wrong way around. And it doesn't work because. Without hex digit in the character string. Oh wait, it's because they're not double, isn't it? I think the next thing it's going to say to me is I haven't loaded up BRM. I'm actually going to open my. Prompt. Yeah. So um, library. Um, what's BRM in? BRM. Yes. Let me... Let's give that a go. Okay. Just library BRMS. Yeah. So if you do that, there we go. Right. So that does a linear model. So um, if I just take this above here and uh, can I just capture this? Oh, no. Is that? It's an R. Yeah. So read RDS. Read underscore rds yeah that or it's capital yeah there you go oh, i haven't loaded anything library uh tidyverse yeah yeah then you could do the other version read rds I, I, I hate using anything that's not um uh, tidyverse right and then what is it it's this so Hopefully that will work. No such file. That's not true. Definitely. That can't be right. Oh, wait. I had to oh, wait. The um, yeah, you did. Uh, let's see. Oh, you got it now. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's good. Oh, wait. So, what's the difference between this one and that one? So, that's just an RDS file, it's not the actual data. I think that's the model that they saved. The M12.01 yes. model. So you can maybe just read that into an object and then you can do things with it. Yeah, but in order to dem uh, what I wanted to demonstrate was. Uh, you wanted to show the doing the actual, uh, yeah. Yeah, the actual data. Um, oh, look over on your left, uh, line 31. It shows where you read it. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Can we get that? Should should get it for you. 
<laughs> it's oh, he's there in, when they it, do it. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's in there. So if we do, wait, it's going to be the same thing. Yeah. Apart from we change this to. Just get it to the right path. Yeah. You can use it here, the package here, here, and he locates the, the, the file just inside the folder. He looks for the folder instead of. Yeah. The package here dot um, here here. Oh, there's here, a package here. called here. I've heard of it. I'm not as familiar with it. Um, I suppose we could try it. Yeah. Um, one second, because I'm um, because if I do this, I can actually press that. Um, and oh, so, and then you can find yes what it is you wish. So to. What's called um, earnings the earnings. Oh, RO, yeah. RFS data earnings samples master. Click on that. Oh, right. And then we want to click on what's it called? Data, data earnings. Oh. What happened? Interesting. Data. Oh, I see how it is. Then, uh, and then you can earnings see that. Me. There that you is go. so yes. deep into a path. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Need you right. right. DF. Let's call it DF. Oh, well, why did it do that, man? The, the format is oh, different. Oh, you did read RDS. You want to do read CSV. Sorry. Yep. That's all. Oh, Let's is it? The read, yeah, the read RDS from before. Yep. There you go. Now, okay. Yeah, if I say a quick look, there's our data. Excellent. Right. So, if we wanted to do, um, so if we look at, say, the model that we built, built previously, um, so what was it? Here we go. It's this, right? So we do that. Um, so in that case, it's, it's, it's just opening up the file, isn't it? But if we use DF instead, it should create the model, no? Um, I think file is just where it's saving the model. So, so you could do anything for that really, I think. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So let's just. Mm, what is it not liking that? Oh, oh just click on DF. DF. Yep, yep, yep. Right, okay. This is what happens when you don't mess it. Right, so now oh, we the reason why they say, yeah. yeah. So the reason why it saves model um, is because what happens is when it actually builds a model, it creates um, several simulations of the same model. Um, and the whole point of that is that it gives a better probability distribution of the outcome of the model because it takes different parts of the data and then um, uh, different draws of the data. And then, as you can see up here, and then re builds several different models. So um, it's got a few warm up and then it's sampling. I can't remember how many, how many samples, do you remember how many samples it takes from each? Um, I think it's like 5,000 perhaps. So it samples about 5,000. It'll tell you potentially. I was just thinking like, because um, uh, is that not 2,000 say? Um, Iterations. 2,000 models. Yeah, so maybe 2,000 is I remember. Anyway, I'll look at the model. Just do the M12.1. M12.1. Right. And you got so, that. And then. So yeah, so, so the ESS is the effective sample size. So that kind of gives you an idea of, you know, roughly oh, yeah. the size of the sample <laughs> you're dealing with. Um, also, this, this uh, one plus eight. Uh, you usually, when you make a formula, in, in, you you can like make an empty model to see yeah. how it. Yeah. So you do do it one. I think you just do one for the empty model. Yeah. 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 Which I think is just to say, oh, here's the average. <laughs> so yeah. The, so it's what I'm going to show is the yeah. fact that um, if yeah. so if you look at a normal linear model. Yeah, it'll uh, do it quick. It, it will yeah. do it quick because it's only doing one. And so if we just put summary in front of this, so it should choose the linear model summary and then it picks out this. So if we just, um, so 
actually that's not the right thing we want to do so what oh, why did i do that right okay pin that oh no go away and then the brm model that we built essentially it does a brm version of the same thing so we built this using this formula and if you look if you look here you'll see that the actual formula this bit here it's the same in both of these. And that's just a normal linear model. So the, the formula is exactly the same. It's just what it does is quite different. And so when we're looking at, um, when, we're, when we're building a Bayesian model, so in this case, we're just building a normal linear model. We've added one um, so that it can't be zero, presumably. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it just takes different draws of data from the from the um, from our sample from our data frame. So if we look go to DF, and we can see that it's got what DF only has one thousand eight hundred and six rows, but what we have are um, several thousand um, models built on those rows. So if we do this. Uh, not DF, sorry. If we do the, what's it called? M12.2, and then we just look at different components in it. We can see whether, we can see the formula. And then we can also see, um, we can also see other features of the data. So that's the data in the background. And then um, what do we want to look for? Um, the pro, is it the prior? So yeah. Is, is, so the prior information is telling you about what what is going into here. Um, what is, is that? Is that the overall? What's fourteen thousand eight hundred? Oh wait, is that to do with this? Hmm. I think I think I think this is. Oh yeah, it's just flat, isn't it? So typically, yeah, flat prior, but you can uh, override it if you have compelling reason to, to do so. Yeah. So the, the priors are the parameters that go into the model, and they tell us about um, how to build different bits of information. We can change the priors um, um, if we have data to change them or to say, oh, well, typically speak, like um, when we talked about before in the past, it was about... Um, What's it called? Um, it was when, the one about uh, the 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 the, the, fa the facial one, the, the one right, to the attractive the attractive people having more girls. I think yeah. yes, that's it. Yeah, it, and w the expectation of whether they'd have more girls or boys, and then um, working out what the um, variation was in the population. And so if we think, well, in, in general, there's um, what's 50 percent of the population is female and mm -hmm. or 51 percent is female and 49 percent is male, mm -hmm. then we can add that as a prior as a bit of prior information and that will affect the different draws that come out just regard, instead of just relying on the data that is built in the model in itself. Um, I believe there's three here. Right, it kind of constrains it. Yeah, so it doesn't mm -hmm. go all over the sample space or, or not as far over the sample space, I think. Yeah. So then if we look at the, if, if instead of looking at the prior information, we then look at, um, what else do you want? There's different, draw, there's, uh, what is the function? There's a function, isn't there? For pulling out the, um, for pulling out posterior, um, not posterior predict. There was the Linpred, and there was um, what was the other one? Oh, where is it? Posterior table. M twelve. 
Oh, and I'm looking at the uh, stand GLM stuff in the book, so that's not as helpful. Let's see. Um, I have to look at the, yeah. What have you got there? I missed the. That is a posterior um, something or other posterior yeah. table. Um, so that sh I believe is pulling out. Let's look what we've got over here. What looks about two thousand. Well, that's probably sigma by the looks of it. Um, that's the why. Isn't oh, it? here's the one where I changed it. They do, they, oh, let me look it up. Because there's something where whenever you do it, it gives you the warning about it being uh, deprecated. So I changed it <laughs> in the code. Um, as draws DF. So if you call the as draws oh, DF that, as... Yeah, on the... That will give you posterior samples. Yeah, okay, here we go. I've got uh, M12, one, two, one, two. okay. So um, if we go, let, let's just capture this bit up here. Oh, no, we can't because it's gone. Um, let's just do summary. Um, 12.14. Nope. Is it summary? Summary sounds right. Yeah. yeah. So okay, you got it. Yep. We have here what 4,000 4, linear models, 4,000 linear models have been built. Yes. Um, and if you look here, um, what happened was there was an iteration. We've got several iterations, got this warm up. And then we've got the total post warm up draws. So I'm not really sure why it does the warm up section. I can't remember why that is, but the 4,000 draws are the 4,000 models that are built based on different draws of the data. And that stabilizes your model build. Um, so here is where we get that from. So when we do a prediction, we can, um, we can do all the linear, the different linear models or say, that we've, we've uh, accounted for different draws of the data in the population from our model build. And so if you look at this, so if we look at our normal, this is our normal one here, um, our normal linear model, this intercept, B intercept would be this here. Mm -hmm. And you can see that it varies quite significantly <coughs> from the different draws. And then this B height is this coefficient over here. Now that's what we've got in the linear model. We see there's a lot of different variation and sigma is the, um, is the standard deviation, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yes. And it's standard deviation uh, because we're much more reliant on the shape of the data as opposed to uh, on these kind of measurements of parametric assumptions. Now, if we go over to the Bayesian probability one, we can see that the, ver the actual values are pretty similar, but not quite. So we can see that the intercept is roughly the same, but ever so slightly different. So this is 85,170 as opposed to 85,027. And then we can also see that the height, uh, the beta coefficient for each, inch height is two points lower. So to be honest, this normal linear model's done a pretty decent job there to some extent. There's not much, there's, there's not much variation in it. However, there is that variation overall. And that's what we want to get, that's what we want to count for, which is this confidence interval in, you know, how confident, how much variation is there you can see that the variation in the actual estimates for this one is 10,000. That's a lot of variation. And in height, again, there's 1,335. So that's the lower confidence interval. And the upper confidence interval is quite large as well. 
which we don't we don't have any of this data here because it's not caught because we don't do lots of different samples and so whilst the bayesian approach is slower it gives us a much more robust outcome which we can then use for comparisons and make more mm, certain was the right word but stronger uh, stronger assumptions about our data and our findings does that help Sure, that's excellent. Brilliant. Yes, very, very important to be able to to pull out these values. Yeah, it's it's, it's really good to mess around with because, uh, like Steve, Steve was saying, it's like you know, if you can, if you just like go to you know build a model yourself, like we just did, then you know, just experimenting with like finding the stuff in the background and then you know going over those functions like what was it was linear pred uh is it posterior pred posterior pred uh or linear pred exact posterior draws of linear predictor possibly transformed by inverse link function and if we do m uh one two so i can't remember what that does <laughs> this is a problem. We've learned so many functions. I can't remember any yeah, of them. Yeah. I can't Some remember them off the top of my head. Anyway, um, <clears throat> might be good to practice some of these with my own data rather than uh, seeing whatever. Anyway, um, so shall, shall, we, shall we get on to um, get back onto this? Right. So essentially, this is a Bayesian linear model and it just adds uncertainty into our linear model. And we can see as We've got here, there's um, randomly, so he's he's here doing what we did above, but he's taking 15 draws or slicing 15 from the posterior samples, um, which is what, um, you know, the different, um, the different models. And then what he's doing down here is visualizing those 15 models. So if you remember, we talked about like throwing different models through. And if you look at this bit here, You can see that there's loads of different lines. So that's the 15 different lines for 15 different models. But of course, this doesn't really make a lot of sense because there are upper and lower limits to all of the data. Um, so basically, what they're trying to show here is that the model intercept is um, conceptually meaningless, um, yeah. which is why you need to um, create, you know, why you need to change your data. So in this case, what they do is they take the earnings database and they uh, basically get standard deviation height. And uh, the expected difference is earning potential. And then by doing this difference, where did they get that from? Oh yeah, this is from the standard deviation. So the difference is standard deviation. And th then they basically create their own um, average, I suppose. Is, which is the point here, isn't it? Different. Mm -hmm. They've always mutated. And then round blah, blah. Sigma minus two. Um, I'm not really sure why it's showing that in particular. Um, but if you look, the data, yeah, it's got a linear model going through what isn't particularly a linear shape, basically. Right. Um, here the expected differences. In early potential is one standard deviation difference in height. In the text in page one four one eight four, the authors list that the different that difference as six hundred and ten dollars, which is a typo. Anyway, the difference in earnings is based on a standard difference in height is relatively small to the magnitude of uh, sigma. He must have a um, an old version of the book because mine says um, sixty one hundred. So okay, yeah, they must have corrected it. Oh well. Anyway, so so another way of looking at the data is you know st uh, so you can transform the data um, mm -hmm. using uh, z scores. Um, and to quote what they say here, another way to scale the coefficients is to standardize the predictor. 
by subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation to yield a z-score. Standardize, standardization using the mean and, stand, and um, standard deviation of predictors uses raw estimates from the data and thus should only be used when the number of observations is big enough that these estimates are stable. When small sample sizes are used, we recommend standardizing using an externally specified population distribution or other externally specified reasonable uh, scales. What that essentially means is when you're doing when you're doing any modeling, be careful about the, the size. Um, often, like when we do experimental research, for instance, or experimental analysis, um, you know, we've got population sizes of like 15 or 30. And in some cases, they might not be appropriate um, because the um, distributions break down. And so the Z scores you get might not be particularly good. Anyway, so the next part is standardization using an externally specified population distribution. Um, so that relates this part that said afterwards. Uh, a related approach is to rescale based on some standard uh, set outside the data. For example, in analysis of test scores, it's common to express estimates on the scale of standard deviations of test scores across all students in a grade. A, a test might be on a scale of zero to 100, with four great fourth graders having a national mean score of 55 and a standard deviation of 18. Then if analysis done on the scale and points of the exam, all coefficients, estimates, and standard deviations from the analysis of fourth graders are divided by 18, so that they are on a universal scale. The virtue of using a fixed scaling rather than uh, standardizing each data set separately is that estimates are all directly comparable, um, which obviously tells us that, you know, for instance, if you're doing cross-cultural research or, um, or any kind of research where you've got different draws of data, that you don't necessarily want those uh, comparisons to be separate, um, you know. And th then there's also the other thing of like when people say, I came top of my year group, well, it really does depend on what school you went to as to what top of your year group means. Um, so, but, you know, we can apply that to all sorts of other kind of social research as well. Um, so standardization using uh, reasonable scales. Sometimes it's useful to keep inputs on familiar scales such as inches, dollars, or years, but make uh, conven convenient rescalings to aid the interpretability of coefficients. For example, we might work with an income of uh, 10, 000, income divided by 10,000 or age in decades. Um, yeah. Anyway, so then, then we come back to this other thing. We've talked about this one before because this is really important with like the heights thing, which is centering and standardizing models. So centering is a really important tool because as we see down here, uh, so you, you set, so how you center data is just simply by um, ex, uh, subtracting the mean from the data. And the reason why you do this is, if it shows us down here, it does not, is because when we have an intercept that is effectively at zero point or something that goes below, um, goes to, starts at zero, um, that it's not very useful for explaining our data. And so when we create a linear model, it doesn't really, it doesn't really change the linear model. It just changes the position of the linear model. Um, which is what we have the high school kids uh, IQ and the mum's IQ score. So, you know, there's no, I very much doubt there's any mums with zero IQ uh, and- It would be, but, uh, yeah, it's very unusual. <laughs> yeah. Um, so th that's what they do here is they're just building this model up here. So um, they just create this linear model with this interaction term between the mother's high school, uh, whether they finished high school or not, and the mother's IQ. And then they've built this model here. Uh, no, sorry, that's just the output. Right, and then when they can, center, can we talk about the? Oh, okay, can we talk about the? So, like the result, what what they 
what they mean. Like this uh, mom as 50.9. Um, this is the, the value which is increased for any unit of increase of the, uh, the posterior, basically, or something like that. Um, so that's the kid's score, whatever that means, which is, I believe, high uh, IQ score. So uh, I think it's some kind of test yeah. score, but yeah, it's some sort of sort of test score. Yeah. yeah, and they're trying to predict it based on the mother's whether the mother completed high school or not, and what the mother's IQ is, plus an interaction term between those uh, two uh, predictors. Mm -hmm. So we can see so that... So I have this, mom. No, no, say it. <laughs> Please go on. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so essentially here is like we can see that before looking at any of the coefficients, apparently we have a, a, an IQ of minus 11, <laughs> which oh. isn't really possible. So, um, and so it doesn't make it much sense here. And also it doesn't really tell us something about, well, what happens if kids got an average score? Um, we want to do everything from the average. So we kind of work left or right from um, left or right from this, these pieces of information that go in. Um, so what we do is we, subtract, we simply subtract the mean to create a centered, um, a centered uh, value. And it just makes it easier for interpretation purposes, really. So what, when we look at this, we say with a centered, um, centered uh, Bayesian model, uh, what we can say is that the average score of a child is 87.7 on the test. And that the mother's whether the mother completed high school or not adds 2.8 points onto the average and that the mother's iq for each point of mother's iq presumably adds 0 0.6 to the uh to the child's test score and the interaction term reduces 0 0.5 um so we can see that to be honest, it makes a lot more sense now because if we're taking 0 0.5 away from, say, this number here, well, we're starting at a middle point. So it's much easier to make predictions and much more understandable. Does it change the... No, it doesn't change that. I don't think it would. Um... Maya. So... <laughs> so when we go down, uh, using conventional centering points, um, so you can do different kinds of centering. So this time they have centered the um, centered using the using uh, so a hundred is the middle point of the any IQ test. So any IQ test on a bell curve would fall. Hundred would be the center point, the mean because that's how we create them. So in different countries, 100 means different things. Um, and then the whether the mother's finished high school or not is center point is 0 0.5. Um, so this is just another way of varying or changing these bits of information. So now we've changed the, not only have we changed the height, we've also centered these these um, predictors as well, which changes these output. So we just look at that, and then go back up here. You can see that there is a slight difference, but not much. Because of because uh, it doesn't actually very close, it. yeah. Yeah, because it doesn't actually change the predictors. Mm -hmm. It just it just puts them into a, a it just it puts them into a, a different scale essentially. Mm -hmm. and that, that's all we're doing with these transformations. We're basically just um, rather than changing the data, what we're really doing is 
changing how they can how the information can be interpreted. Um, so another way of standardizing is by subtracting the mean and dividing by two standard deviations. And why would we want to do that? Because that's the Z score. So here we so here we take we subtract the mean, and then we subtract um, the two then uh, divide that by two standard deviations to create Z scores. And that changes these values quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. hmm. But that's so that we, because we've changed the scale and now the scale is all on the, rather than being on the scale of the, rather than being on the scale of the, um, what's it called? Well, rather than being on the scale of, oh my God, my brain is so tired. <laughs> um, rather than being on the scale of their individual predictors, so the IQ score or the height, they're now on the scale of the outcome variable, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I believe it's a way to make them more comparable. Maybe a way to interpret it. Mm. It's because you, you, uh, you've scaled them all to, <laughs> to be, yeah, similar, oh. to, to reflect the uh, differences better. Oh, yeah. Sorry, it's not scale of the, uh, what's it, of the output variable. It's the scale, of, yeah, it's just on um, the, the, what's it, standard distribution, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So this is how many Z scores, uh, how many right. Z, Z, Z units increase. Oh, yeah. So if you That's, step away by this amount, you'll see this change, yeah. Yeah, so, oh yeah, because that because it's quite, but then that's quite a large difference, isn't it? So, you know, mm -hmm. one standard deviation increase in uh, the mother's, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, one standard deviation in, oh, I'm not sure if that makes sense. One standard deviation increase, so, which is the only possible It kind of feels weird when you're dealing with a uh, binary variable hole or yeah, something like high school. But they yeah, kind of explain it to... further on, I think. I don't know. Um, they explain that that's why they scale it by two. Yeah, for yeah. binary variables. Now the coefficients for the two predictors are on the same metrics. Yeah, making it easier to compare them um, I suppose it shows their actual individual weighting. Um, so yeah. Right. Um, so it's kind of like how, oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the mother's IQ is much more important than whether they finished IQ high school or not. That's quite interesting. Right. Um, uh, because of the standardizing method, they are interpreted as one unit change in the, re oh, right. This is what I was trying to do <laughs> myself. One unit uh, change in rescale predictor corresponds to a change of one standard deviation below the mean to one standard deviation above. Mm -hmm. hmm. So why two standard deviations? Uh, recall that for a binary or binomial variable, the population standard deviation may be computed as sigma is a function of the square root of p uh, times one minus p. What does P represent here? So this uh, the probability. Oh. But that's, that's a standard formula for Sorry. this type of, of uh, uh, distribution, uh, uh, binomial. That, that, that's absolutely fine like that. Okay. That, that's standard. You find the formula. Yeah. Okay. Where P is probability is given, uh, is a one. Here's what it means. So the probability is given as one. That means that the probability is 0.5. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So if we do that precise formula, we get 0.5. Right, because yeah. you ha you have a binomial. You know, you you have uh, um, like five percent chance of something to happen or five percent chance something doesn't happen. Yeah. So you set this and 
uh, and then the the opposite is one minus p, which is still no point five because yeah, mm -hmm. no, it has a sense. Um, yeah, this does vary across parameter space. So p is such that uh, the value decreases as you move away from p equals point five. To give a sense, here is sigma of a function of p of a range of values. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, this is just contrived data, and what it's showing us is the variance in the probability, which is just, well, I suppose it's kind of a normal distribution. Not really, it's about, it's, uh, what's it? Reminds me of the, uh, what's like the a semicircle. Almost, yeah. It's kind of a flattened semicircle. Yeah. In the limit. Uh, in the limit, a binary variable for which uh, e equals 0.5, that was uh, standardized accordingly to the, uh, the scheme. Oh, sorry, this is 4.5. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, your probability is either 0 or 1, isn't it? His example was 10,000 trials. Right. There you go. So you can see with 10,000 trials, the probabilities are of, of Zero and one are almost always 50. Mm -hmm. Or oh, sorry, 0.5. But looks if we use population values that we then standardize. They have been essentially the same. In fact, actually, they're better. Mm -hmm. um, if we want to use a standardized binary variable as a predictor, um, its coefficient would reflect comparisons between zero and, sorry, x equals zero and x equals one. Here are the values of the binary variable that would take on the on the standardization if a population variable, but according to more conventional uh, scheme of x minus. Um, I can't remember how to pronounce that. Mu. Mu. Um, mu x. So that's mean of x mm -hmm. divided by sigma uh, of x, which is one or zero. It's essentially the same right. thing. That's different. Well, it's not quite the same thing. Um, in a regression context, the coefficient uh, corresponds to half the difference between the two possible values, which isn't as easy to interpret. Oh, well, makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not not as easy to interpret, is it? No. Yeah. Uh, so actually, it does make sense to uh, to mutate it because when we go back up to here, is divided right by the two. Yeah. yeah. How did they say you interpret that? Uh, one unit change in a rescale so, value. But oh, he yeah. did a, the the explanation why uh, he scaled by two, so by mm. two standard deviation, and then right because then I believe what your end result is is that if you have a binary variable. It's saying, you know, if your binary variable goes from zero to one, you would see, you know, this comparison. So it's on, on the same scale. Well, if you're in the middle, and if you're, if in, you're the in the middle, middle yeah. Hey, then uh, two standard deviations is one or zero, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> I think I might need to re read that bit. <laughs> anyway, multiplying each regression coefficient by two standard deviations of its predictor. For models with no interactions, a the, uh, procedure that is equivalent to centering and rescaling is to leave the regression predictors as is and create rescaled regression coefficients by multiplying each beta by two times standard deviation of the corresponding x. This gives a sense of the importance of each vari variable. So basically what it's saying is <clears throat> adjust the coefficients rather than adjusting the actual underlying data, which might actually be <clears throat> uh, computationally cheaper. Uh, given a simple Gaussian model, correlation regression to mean, given a simple Ga Gaussian model, which is uh, yi is a product of, um, of the intercept and a, uh, and a beta coefficient term plus error, the variables are standardized in the conventional way of uh, 
uh, the coefficient being um, the probability of x and y, x given y, sorry. Y given x? I think that this is the correlation. What it, what it, 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 this is not a p. Oh, okay. This is rho. I don't know how you pronounce it, but rho is the... Rho? The... Rho. Yeah. Okay. I think it, I think it's that. Because, um... Yeah. I thought rho was an R. Oh, oh, oh yeah, Gosh. yeah, I, I see, I see. Yeah, it's down here, isn't it? Uh, ah, that's right, right yeah. Okay, so the principal component line and the regression line. It's not clear to me if we have direct access to simulated data in section. Happily, it's easy to simulate standardized data with a given correlation using something I've never heard of before. We draw 1,000 cases. So uh, over here, this is the sample size we're accept. So 1,000 1,000 with uh, variances of one and a row of 0.5 correlation. And then we're creating a matrix here with one exponential two, um, sigma times sigma times row. So a few times. And then that again, probably. Yeah, I've seen I've seen this uh, doing it. It's like uh, um, a research, like a question that you make to see how the correlation of the variable by varies. Um, uh, so you use this method. It's quite quite nice, too, quite useful. Okay. Um, I think he's drawing it down here anyway. Yeah. There we go. Right. So this is uh, this is our correlation line, the regression coefficient. Uh, what is the point of this principal component line and the regression line? Oh. Um, so this highlights how the line, uh, how the line that most optimally intercepts with the data cloud, mm -hmm. um, the principal component line on the left is not the same as the line that optimally intersects the best prediction of y given x. The regression line is meant to optimize the vertical distance of the points to the line. The slopes of the two plots are 1 and 0 0.5, respectively. That's quite interesting. I would have thought they were the same. I think that they then say, um, yeah, so if you look at either extreme, if you look at the left extreme, all your points are above the line for the principal component. And then if you look at the right side, everything's below, which is not really what you want. You want kind of a half and half situation. Mm. So I think that's, yeah, why it ends up, it makes more sense. If you're trying to minimize the Y distance, that it would be, uh, the slope is less. Because mm. originally you would think, let's just uh, minimize the distance from the line. But but you're actually looking at you know how how does the y uh, you know respond to whatever x is? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's not quite the same thing, is it? Well, not because uh, this is the, the regression line. So you say that the, the variables are quite correlated. So they go, uh, they, they they increase. Yeah. Linearly, there is a linear increase of uh, of the values, and the principal component is like a dimensionality reduction thing. Mm -hmm. So this way, you have uh, uh, this is what what are x and y? It's the two components. So uh, so component um, because. Um, So 
so you you can see as you said that which which one is the the of the two is more like grouped on a side more than the other so you see that the most part of the so you can slide you see that the, the largest part of, part of the the values are on the 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 y panel more than on the x panel but you know but this is different from the regression line mm -hmm. and the principal component takes consideration of the variance so it accounts for the the highest level of variance within the variables yeah okay all right so um so now we're brought back to regression to the mean which is uh when x and y uh, are standardized, that is placed on a common scale, as in figure 12.2, which is somewhere else. Um, the regression line always has a slope of less than one. Oh, yes, that is that, isn't it? Uh, no. mm -hmm. um, thus, when x is one standard deviation above the mean, the predicted value of y is somewhere between zero and one standard deviations above the mean. This phenomena in linear models that y is predicted to be closer to the mean than x is called regression to the mean um, and occurs in many different varied contexts as we have discussed previously. The authors then describe how this work with a um, example of mother's heights predicting the heights of their daughters. I'm not aware that we have such a data set among the connected to the text. We can reproduce uh, our synthetic data set D from the above, staying within standardized metric. We name X for our variable uh, mother's height and then rename the Y variable daughter's height, which is what they do here, and then refit it. And yes. Now consider the example from text. If a woman is 10 inches taller than the average for her sex and the correlation of mothers and adults and daughter's height is 0 0.5, then the daughter's predicted height is five inches taller than, than average. Based, yeah, based on the quick internet search, uh, women's heights in the USA are approximately distributed as normal uh, 64.5 inches with uh, 2.5 standard deviation. Is that standard error? Standard? Okay. Um, thus, a 10 unit difference on inches scale would be about four sigma difference on the standardized scale. Here, the daughter's height value of, on our model would be predicted as mom's, the mum's height as equals equals four. So then they do that with the coefficients in order to predict. They get about two, yeah. Yeah. That estimates a outcome of two inches taller, if I'm right. Oranges? Oranges? Mm. Thus, if the mum is a four sigma outlier, or four sigma, the model predicts that her daughter will be about two in, uh, uh, two sigma outlier. So basically, the daughters move more towards the mean um, than the mother because that's the regression to the mean. Da, 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 and so, what it's doing here is mum's height, daughter's height. Um, mom's height, daughter's height, da, 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 da. Uh, st standardized metric, inches metric, same measure. So it's not going on. Mom's height, daughter's height. So yeah, so four grade. Oh yeah, so that's four and two. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, because when we have inches is. Well, it's the same thing. It's just not showing it. It's just showing it in different ways. Right. Different scale. Yeah. The plots show the relationship in both standardized left and right. The fitted line and 95% ribbon are based on the model. The dotted lines highlight the prediction of the 
taller than average mother for her daughter's height. This is the regression to the mean. Does, if you, just a quick question, which would you prefer to use in a professional context? If I was presenting it to somebody, I'd probably use inches. <laughs> yeah, because the standardized measure, it doesn't really add anything here, does it? Mm. And also quite often is when you are making predictions about things, you might do them on a standardized or, well, typically I often use logarithmic scales, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't necessarily um, do much more than, they always get converted back for understanding. Right. Anyway, um, which brings us on to logarithmic transformations. Um, however, we are seven minutes past nine. Um, so if you guys want to get, do you guys want to get off? Or do you want to discuss this quickly? I probably should drop off pretty soon. Um, if you guys want to keep going, uh, I can catch up with you. Yeah, so I think this is a good stopping point um, because logarithmic is quite different from the standardization stuff we were doing before. Right, it'd be probably be good to yeah focus on it a little more. Yeah, and I think we can probably get through the next sections quite quickly because it's all about making the linear, well, non-linear data um, more usable. Whereas the other stuff is kind of about understanding different scale, different putting things onto different scales. Right. Um, yeah, I agree. I think I think it should be should be easier to kind of zip through the rest. Yeah. Cool. Um, cool. Nice, nice plots here too that we have to look forward to. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Sorry, uh, Rodrigo. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. Yes. Uh, let Let's uh, pick up from from uh, from here next time. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, okay. I I think we should be able to finish this as well next time because it's pretty it's fairly straightforward, but you know it's quite interesting to go over this kind of stuff again. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yep. All right. Um. Uh, thanks for your time, guys. Yeah. Thanks. Good to talk to you all, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.